also thank you for inviting me. So I have been to Hello. 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 And um, thank you all for staying and not leaving for your Christmas vacation uh, early. Um, I um, have started an organization called Sapiens Purim. And they, this is an advocacy group. Um, its purpose is to clarify and contextualize technological developments and their impact on people, which is what we are all working on. Right? But in addition, I feel that we have a need to encourage popular engagement in this process in order to succeed. Um, because I do not believe that we are going to be able to regulate. Uh, so I think it's going to have to be an emergent kind of control, a bottom-up control. Um, so that's why I think popular education and engagement is important. Um, we all know that the uh, global brain development is accelerating, and it's accelerating at a speed that I'm just finding. It's accelerating acceleration, which is uh, quite breathtaking. Um, what I want to talk about today is that um, the kind of drive that will um, be involved in decision making with artificial general intelligence and with global brain, and how that drive will incorporate self-awareness and what self-awareness means to a global brain, um, and that uh, the options for control that we may have as human beings as this integration occurs. And I've come up with the beginnings of a model, just the bare, bare beginnings. So, I'll start with some definitions. Um, AGI, I think, if you use it as Ben Gersel does, uh, you know, this is a um, creation of humankind uh, that often is, is used to mean something separate from humankind as opposed to the global brain, which includes, of course, humankind and other technologies. Um, I'm suggesting that the term sapiens plurum can be used to indicate that the global brain is the next generation of humanity. So that this is a name for this new kind of human. Sapiens plurum, uh, the wisdom of many. Yes. Um, we were just talking earlier about uh, sapiens plurum, how rapidly it was involved. This top one is the open mind, open source um, that I was uh, describing uh, with Martha um, uh, earlier. It's an open source um, code for uh, direct brain uh, interface, uh, for interhuman telepathy, <coughs> for a robot uh, interface, uh, for a 3D printer interface. Um, I am waiting myself for the direct brain MATLAB interface. I want the plug-in module, you know. <laughs> Why should we have to do all those calculations? Mm -hmm. I see people are excited about this. <laughs> okay. So uh, where are the uh, where are the utility equation? Where is the goals, the function going to come from? You know, we have the sci-fi scenarios that say it's going to be the evil machines against the people, but of course, it's actually people who use intelligent machines against other people. So the question is, whose priorities? Which people? are going to drive these smart machines and we might like to think that academics and technologists will drive them but uh, obviously that's uh, there are people who pay salaries and who uh, determine grant uh, descriptions and their intentions are not always those uh, that uh, other people would choose for themselves and then of course we have the military uh, who have different priorities so we don't know who's going to even set these initial utility functions that uh, Bill Hibbard and Stephen Woodrow and Ben and, and uh, Kaspranke and many other researchers um, say will at least drive 
the initial ethical decision making uh, of AGI members or AGI. Members. Uh, Omohundro, Steve has put has come up with four other drives, um, which, if we as the machine starts to develop its own self awareness and its own um, needs, he has described four other drives that may help determine its actions: as self protective, acquisitive, um, and then a drive for efficiency and a drive for self improvement. Now, um, uh, Steve has come up with these four drives because he believes that we must encourage AGI to be self-aware. And the reason he wants to encourage AGI to be self-aware, which many of us view as a sort of Pandora's box that we don't really want to open, um, the reason he thinks it's important is that he thinks otherwise you're going to end up with a narrow utility drive which can cause all kinds of problems. Um, with a narrow utility drive, his example is, suppose you tell the robot that it wants to win as many chess games as it can. Well, um, what uh, uh, Hibbert and Hutter and Dewey say is, well, the easiest way to do that is just to increment your counter, right? And, you know, oh, I want more chess games. And uh, you can run it up to as far as, as the computer will allow you. But, Steve is, is afraid of more dire consequences, which is that when you try to turn the robot down for maintenance, uh, it's going to kill you because, hey, you're interrupting my ability to win more chess games. So uh, Steve says that in order to um, avoid that, you have to incorporate self-awareness in the system. You have to move it from a narrow uh, utility function to a general utility function. And the reason that this helps is that then you can compare, um, you have knowledge about human beings are valuable. You know, you have a more general view of the world. You have the ability to, for the robot to act as a, or the uh, AGI to act as a social system, which says, okay, I get no esteem from just um, uh, incrementing my counter. Uh, that's not going to help me win or achieve my goal um, because I need social esteem as well. So that ability for self-actualization is then another factor. I want to improve my chess game. I want to become better. But as I said before, all that <clears throat> self-awareness opens a Pandora box because a self-aware entity seeks resources and it has seeks boundaries and it needs security. It can become afraid for itself. I think most people who talk about self-awareness forget that in order to have self-awareness you have to have a self. Mm. And with AGIs and, um, and the global brain in particular, what is a self? So I looked at how humans become self-aware. And um, one person, Philippe uh, Rocher, of um, Emory University has done a lot of work on this. And he talks about how in utero you have the double touch. You, you feel with your thumb and you feel within your mouth. So that double touch is me uh, versus putting you know, uh, a pacifier or something in your mouth and you don't have the double touch. Um, then the other uh, important aspect of learning me, we, us is in seeing the mother or the parent respond to the child um, that you know you exist because you can see it in someone else's eyes uh, in responding to you. And then, of course, the child learns in the mirror to recognize uh, him or herself. And elephants have learned to do this too. Um, uh, another fellow at Emory, um, Franz de Wolf, actually, uh, has, has worked on that as well. So humans, uh, they learn self versus other. And then they start to see the impact of their outcomes. They start to see their outcomes compared with other people for a, a relative self-esteem. They start to interpret the feelings of others and to be able to predict how others are going to respond based on their facial expressions. And then they start to develop theory of mind, which means that I know that what you think is different than what I think, and I can guess at what you might think. 
So that brings us back to the self-aware AGI and what will it consider to be itself. So we have um, Steve Omohundro and, and some others have talked about matching utility functions. I, I know that in a group or a team, that can create a sort of team spirit. I'm not sure it, it, it can create an in-group. I see how it creates an in-group. I'm not sure how a uh, utility function could be a definition of self. Um, you can look at the history trace of your actions and say, all these things I've performed are me, and that might be a little bit more like humans actually do, because when you think of someone with Alzheimer's who's lost that, and then we say they've sort of lost their selves, themselves. Um, you know, you can look at it from a network perspective, you know, what am I linked to, but I'm not, I'm not sure uh, it would work. Um, and the other thing about matching utility functions, if your utility function is a greedy function, then the other people with the matching utility function are actually your competitors, <laughs> because you're fighting over the same resources. So, then that brings you to, okay, I'm on a quantum computer, and here's my secure facility, and everything within my secure facility is me. That doesn't, it's certainly not a, a global brain concept, and probably not even an AGI. So, uh, what might it include? So, a uh, global brain certainly includes the people who work on it. Um, it would include any animals who might be attached to it. Um, it, it, it might even include plants uh, that the global brain is responsible for in this, in this nurturing. So, a lot of, uh, I've heard some people, I think uh, Ben seems to, I wonder sometimes if he thinks this Ben goes on, uh, that the global brain is going to redesign itself from scratch. And that's certainly not the way nature normally works. And I rather doubt uh, it is how uh, things will evolve. So, uh, I doubt that they're going to toss away the uh, capabilities of human beings. I think it will be incorporated. So if the AGI incorporates existing entities, which in uh, the last conversation with Ben Gersel, he actually said, oh yes, it's going to start uh, with human beings as part of the AGI. Um, if it actually incorporates humans from the beginning, I don't see a big distinction between an artificial global intelligence and a global brain, other than perhaps the, the time span one expects humans to still be around as, uh, as distinct entities as part of it. Um, so from now on, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about sapiens plura, which is the name that I'm using for global brain, to mean AGI and global brain, and what I'm calling sapiens plura. So, what constitutes self-interest to the sapiens plural? Um, again, we have all the, all the possibilities that we discussed earlier. Uh, any of those could be used. I don't really have any answer uh, to what is the self, but I do have some ideas on how things might evolve. So the more conditions vary around an entity, the more it needs to move the greater intellect it requires uh, to deal with that control system. And that control system is actually what humans have developed into what we call the limbic system of emotions. So we look at a quantum computer, that's, uh, it's got another computer caring for it. Um, the amoeba, of course, is moving around a little bit, but he has a, he's in a medium that supplies all its needs. Mobile robots and animals, um, that have to deal with a higher, a more highly uh, variable environment require both more intelligence and more control system, or more in, in bio and organic <coughs> and we'll call it in motion. Um, but it's hard to determine whether something is actually an agent or an environment. It all depends on your point of view. You know, are you the agent that's inside, or are you the environment that's outside, or are you Someone's working on distributed systems. Um, Sapiens plurum, I think, could be viewed in lots of different ways. So if 
we're looking at it as Sapiens Plurum, the environment, than anything within it is its components. If we're looking at Sapiens Plurum as embedded, say, within the solar system, uh, then the solar system is providing the energy that it needs to function and its, its actions take place within that larger environment. Um, if we look at it as a mobile agent, say, on Earth, <coughs> then we can start to think of <coughs> various sapiens from individuals, because we assume that China's uh, sapiens form and uh, some of the Western sapiens form are not going to be too very closely intertwined. Um, if we look at these as different individuals, um, then we can consider them, maybe they'll be mobile agents. It's, that one's a little bit hard to think of as an individual mobile agent. It's easier to think of them as distributed and variable agents. The thing about uh, distributed agents, though, uh, when we start to look at social systems and environments, is that uh, something like a wolf or even bacteria, um, wolves in the summer, they're quite individual entities, but in the winter, when hardship arrives, then they, they come together um, as, as a wolf pack and pretty much operate as a, a single function and then they'll break back up. And certain bacteria do the same thing when they're under duress. They'll come together and form a slime, and then they'll break up the country. That, that may be the best uh, visualization of how the savings part might work. The one thing I am pretty sure of is that Sages Parham will want some embodiment, which for when you think of it as, as a virtual system, you think, well, why would it need a body? But how is it going to have a self without boundaries? Okay. Um, first of all, things that have no boundaries, they just keep self-replicating because they have no idea of the distinction between them and the environment, and they'll use up all the resources. And, and probably the sapiens poor will be smart enough to know that that would happen and wouldn't want to try to stop it. Um, looking at it from a security point, if you have offline storage with a bounded entity, of course that's more secure. Mobility increases security. Self-awareness becomes a simpler. And all the issues of lifespan, which we see as drawbacks to being uh, a mechanic, uh, people don't seem to apply to a savings plan. It's sort of hard to think about. I tried to think about what does reproduction mean to a savings plan. I, I didn't come up with anything. <laughs> what does need reproduction as a savings plan? Yeah. So, once you have a body, so assuming that it will need boundaries, some kind of body, then the needs of of retaining that well. Think about, uh, I mean, just think about, you know, uh, Maxwell's demon, okay? Um, if, if you don't have Maxwell's demon there to open the door between you and, and the rest of the world, you, you don't have, you have just uh, the lowest possible entropy, right? So, um, behaviors are rooted in physical needs. So once you have a body, you need a control system, an emotional system, to take care of that. And if you don't have a body, then you have no needs as an entity. All your drives, everything that you do has to be told to you externally because you have no inner needs. You can have rules that you have to follow because you're given them, but you, you don't have any needs. So, uh, these bodily sensations, this is from Antonio Damasio, and you read Antonio Damasio's work. He's a neuroscientist who uh, works with a lot of people who have um, serious uh, cognition problems, and, and particularly limbic system problems. Um, and he has come up with a somatic marker hypothesis. Is that ringing bells? Um, so his idea is that 
a conception of emotion is really just a map of our bodily sensations. That there's no distinct anger, it's just my heart beats rising, um, my skin conductance is higher, I'm breathing quickly. And it's that map of these bodily processes that are what you, you're, you recognize, your brain recognizes as anger. So um, those are what I'm suggesting that we look at as a basis um, for bringing together this control system. And if you look at human emotion as the sort of most advanced parallel animal computer for control system for an entity, um, then we can start to think about how it might interface with uh, the rest of our system. So uh, the limbic system processes data about the body and its environment, and it alerts the cognition system of unexpected conditions. It evaluates and communicates risk and reward, and then it decides what's important and filters that out and stores the important information. And the value is where we link value with me. Now we have the old um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, which he originally put into a hierarchy. We don't look at it that way anymore. But we have the physiological needs, and I've expanded on this from Maslow's original, but it includes all the physiological drives, and security, social connectedness, esteem, self-actualization. And then, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Perlovsky, but he's added a knowledge instinct. He's saying that we, we also have a very basic drive to seek knowledge, because that's was required for you. Uh, actually, Mazza did mention the knowledge there, but somehow he never included it in his spirit. Oh, really? Yeah, never understood quite well why. Huh. He had a cognitive motive, so a motive for acquiring knowledge. Oh, good. Well, so I've looked at Perlovsky's instinct, and I am calling it cognitive consistency, which Perlovsky talks about, but then he ends up labeling it the knowledge instinct. I call it cognitive consistency because it seems to me that a lot of people we might not think of as having an uh, instinct to acquire knowledge, they may have this set of beliefs that they have been taught. And when the world around them becomes inconsistent with their beliefs, they become very upset. And yet I think cognitive consistency can also include that, that academic side of thirst for knowledge. So I was trying to find something that was more inclusive, um, that could work for academics and non-academics. Um, so I call it that. <clears throat> what I'm suggesting is, when, when you start to look at people's, uh, many researchers' um, goals and motivations for uh, AGI, you'll find that what they're trying to do is to get rid of emotion and to become more rational. What I want to suggest is that rationality is a drive, it is a need, and it, it comes from this um, cognitive consistency need um, and, and, uh, and, self and esteem and self-actualization, but primarily the cognitive consistency. Now, cognitive consistency is much more difficult to achieve than you would expect, and that's why it can only be on the top of the pyramid. You first need to make sure that you have all the other drives, and sometimes they are inconsistent. But it's better to have them and have them inconsistent than not to have them. So the consistency is kind of a luxury in a certain sense that you can only reach at a higher level. And the mistake many people in AI make is to start from that level, and then they see that they miss all kind of other things. That's and that's very interesting, because it fits with it. I don't know if you've seen Dan Levine's um, network of, uh, based on Maslow's needs. That's what's up here now. And what he says is that um, because it's a competitive collaborative network, you know, the standard um, setup is that we our, our physical and safety needs are much stronger. But uh, you can actually. Later on, about it, but you can actually uh, retrain that set of needs. For instance, in the case of terrorists or um, uh, religious radicals, 
uh, and, and even our military. You can retrain it so that these other parts of the network are higher, so that I'll give my life for my country, you know, and, and, uh, and, and these things. Um, even though normally, obviously, a self aware being looks out for itself. Um, so, and normally you inhibit the, uh, the cognitive consistency. So, if we want to reverse engineer our limbic computers to kind of, uh, you know, put, move them into the system, or at least understand how they might work with the system, um, we can think of this interoceptive state map as being somatic markers. And then um, the body, the thought of Antonio Damasio is that, the, and, and other researchers too, um, you know, uh, Niedenthal has done quite an extensive work on this, that the body uh, simulates an interoceptive map. So, when you say the word anger, and your body actually needs to recall that state in order to experience it. And, and what Paul Anitathal has done is taken uh, people and, and made it so that they can't move the bottom of their face, but they still can move their foreheads. And she finds that when she does that, it inhibits um, their ability for emotions that use the lower part of the face, which I believe is joy and some other emotions. Um, but it didn't inhibit anger, which is a primarily that sort of an expression. Uh, I thought that was fascinating. Um, the, yeah. So uh, Antonio Damasio, the way he started studying this was to look at people who had serious injuries in certain parts of the limbic system. And in particular, there was one man whose anterior cingulate cortex uh, was um, destroyed. And perhaps you've read about this fellow, but he can't make any decision, even though he's a very bright fellow. And he can list, say, when they're asking him to make his next appointment. He can list all the reasons why it might be one day or another day, but he cannot compare them and come to a conclusion about which is the best. Because that is done in the anterior cingulate cortex, which is this bit of the brain um, in green here. Um, we have, in the anterior cingulate cortex, we are comparing conceptions versus our perceptions, our perceptions, what are our goals or expectations or wants to, what do we think should happen or, or is going to happen versus our reality and these come from our drives and memory and executive function. They can be plans, they can be remembrances of what usually happens or they can be what we want to happen. Whereas our perceptual inputs are coming from our senses or our interoceptive brain map of our body, obviously. So, let's start looking at how that plays into the way utility problems <coughs> might be uh, looked at. So, if we're driven by the disparity between these uh, needs and expectations and goals, the difference between playing chess and the way people operate is that uh, we try to reduce the number of choices that we make, uh, our decisions, and to uh, reduce complexity through habit and procedures and processes and rules. So when people start making decisions, um, they check what's going on, and if unless uh, something risky is happening, they just continue. They don't make a new decision. <coughs> they just continue with the current process. So what I've looked at is that most of the decision-making models ignore complexity. And as we know, um, uh, complexity can create um, chaos. And it's very, the less predictable a situation the human being is in, uh, the riskier the situation is for it. So if, if I'm in a situation like playing chess, sure, I can, I can think of the optimal solution before I proceed to my next decision. But if I'm a human being, I don't want too many decisions uh, to start
sorry, it's proliferating. What I've got here is, is this is channel capacity. It's just um, current entropy minus conditional entropy um, times the maximum symbol wave for this, uh, this channel e equals capacity. Now see, m most people who are looking at making decisions are saying, oh, well, our channel capacity is going to be enormous, right? So um, as our channel capacity goes to infinity, um, you know, our, our conditional entropy will be zero. And we'll be able to make as many decisions as we want, right? Well, in unpredictable situations, in actuality, your uh, conditional entropy is almost equal to your original entropy because you've gained very little knowledge through the decision. Right? Normally, when you make a decision, uh, your entropy drops. You've, you've got a lot more information than you did before you made the decision, and you have uh, uh, fewer options. So, but if you're making if you're making um, decisions and uh, you don't gain a lot of knowledge through that decision, then um, even if your channel capacity becomes huge, uh, your, I mean, your, um, excuse me, your symbol rate becomes huge, your channel capacity does not. Um, actually, I was going to give an example of that to make that more concrete. Oh, it, my, the example's coming up next. So this, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this. I'm, I'll give you the slides and, and but um, in, as you know, in a logistics equation, every time you come to a bifurcation, of course, it becomes more complex. So I'm suggesting that as we, um, because of this situation, that kind of dynamic situation, your complexity is actually increasing, not decreasing, um, you can reach chaos. So bringing this back to chess um, and, and uh, a typical utility function, um, with a typical utility function, at each step, at you, every time you make a decision, you're trying to make the optimal decision. Whereas I'm saying, in a dynamic situation, and we learned this with robots, uh, it, basically, if you do that, if you make the optimal decision with robots at every step, and add, start adding more robots, they're all going to crash into each other or uh, be dancing around uh, as they come to an intersection. So if each of them is trying to find the best path, but they have no knowledge about what the other robots are doing. Um, as I say, they'll all be dancing, and as you ask more robots, you'll just have a chaotic situation, and they'll stand there and dance with each other. Uh, what you end up doing is, with robots and what our brain does is that you decide on a path, and uh, so I am going to go down that hallway, and I'm going to keep going down that hallway. I may have to stop because something's in my way, um, and it's possible I might have to totally replan, but unless something, uh, emergency situation comes up, uh, I'm just going to keep going down that hallway as, as much as I can. And that is more what robots and brains do. Um, there are other reasons that utility functions break, which uh, the um, von Neumann Savage utility functions, particularly the Savage, um, they have needs for a common prior assumption when they start uh, working with a multi-agent group. So the savage utility is fine if you've only got one agent, but you have to step back uh, in time and make inference based on the back step uh, of what the reason was for your utility. And uh, if you do that with all your agents, you have all your agents backstepping, they're all backstepping to different states, and so that, that gets confusing. And the savage utility also looks at a small world, and of course when you're working with a global brain, you've got all sorts of problems and you can't um, enumerate the potential outcomes. So uh, a fellow, let's see, whose team was this? Oh, yeah, uh, Hugendorn, um, Merck and Ruschli. Um, published a partially somatic decision model that used somatic markers, but they used it in a two-step or a hierarchical process, um, and they set those somatic markers um, and went through a somatic uh, 
um, decision process and then followed it with what they called a rational decision process. That is not what I'm suggesting. Um, they were looking at fighter pilots and how they make decisions. Um, and they came up with these goals of surviving and killing the enemy and completing the mission, um, which of course can be competing goals. And um, they set them in hierarchies, have them go through an emotional decision, and then um, move on and, and define the best utilitarian uh, means to come to that decision. Well, I'm suggesting that these drives or these goals are not preset that they're dynamic. Um, our need for safety and social esteem and self-actualization and cognitive consistency. Um, and so they're constantly fluctuating and that we need a model that um, allows that to happen. This is Daniel Levine's whole network. I showed you part of it earlier. Um, but he's incorporated Maslow's uh, decision-making into a competitive collaborative network. And as I said earlier, through training, you can change the emphasis. You'll see that the arrow here becomes different based on somebody else show that um, based on training. So someone who's involved in a military team will be looking more for, you know, I'm going to uh, care for my teammates and I'm going to um, achieve the esteem of my colleagues uh, through my actions rather than to take care of myself. So, uh, given that, at least I'm saying that rationality is, is um, an emotional state, that's when the need down here becomes stronger. And we've been trained, I think as academicians, most of us are down here, um, that we might not get our lives for our, for our uh, jobs, but um, we're trained to have a stronger than normal uh, need or self-actualization and cognitive consistency. So I was asking myself, okay, so how can we combine these emotional drives and this need to reduce complexity into some kind of decision-making model? <coughs> so <coughs> what I'm saying is uh, this uh, delta here is our conceptions minus our perceptions. So it's, it's a, a difference. This is the disparity that that part of your brain called the ACK. <laughs> I call it the ACK because it goes, ah! <laughs> but um, it's the disparity that says something wrong. So I'm comparing that comp disparity with two things. First, your emergency threshold. Oh, my life's in danger. You know, that uh, where you go into the mode of, of automatic reactions. Or the Okay, my life's not in danger, but uh, this situation is not proceeding the way that I wanted or expected it to, which is the last door. So obviously we've got the danger option, the alert option, or let's continue as normal. So rather than having the model, which at every step is just saying, let's consider all the options and decide on the best one, we've got this sort of three state. So that bit that I just showed you is here. So we start, and we're always on a current path. So even when you wake up in the morning, you're, you know, you sort of fall into your set habit. Um, so you'll continue the current procedure, follow your set habit, and then you'll do uh, every, every um, say, towel um, time step. You'll do this comparison, and you'll go into emergency state, continue as normal, or you'll say, hmm, something's wrong, let's figure out what's wrong. And that's pretty much repeating what had here with the train. Um, so now you get into the plan and decide mode. And the difference between this again with a standard utility function, it's kind of hard to follow this all the way through, but um, the basic difference between this model and the standard utility function again is that you're not, even when you alert and say uh, something's wrong and I need to make a decision, you're not automatically looking for the best decision. And you know we don't. We don't look for the best decisions. And there are reasons, good reasons for that. Uh, time might be short. Cost of decision making is very high, which could do with complexity of other reasons. Um, or 
your dominant drive might be something different than what's normally considered utilitarian and utility function. Um, so when we get to the utility function and we start to look at you know, how, how far off is my current state um, compared to my expected utility, we can sort through the options, but if time runs out, we're going to go with our best option that we've got to date and move on. Um, if I have a sort of low risk approach to life, I may just find the first option that falls above the uh, nece uh, necessary level. And I may go on, even though it might not be the best option. So this model looks at um, a little different way than the standard utility model. So how do we incorporate perceptual inputs to Sabian's plural? Um, I think the, the human senses are a way to bring this kind of emotion, you know, information, into Sabian's plural. And as we know, we already have devices that are starting to do this, and these will extend more. With those, we can bring the heart, the emotion, into our decisions. And this is the point at which we're looking not just at um, expected utility, but also at the somatic markers. Now the question is, what are somatic markers to a sapiens poem? Um, I think we're probably talking about some kind of, of um, uh, extrapolated um, crowdsourced goals looking at responses. Now, uh, Herzl and, uh, oh, Yudkowsky and Herzl both come up with the <coughs> coherent extrapolated blending volition. Um, if you've read their paper on that, which are, it's not, it's fairly recent, I think, maybe within the last year. Um, basically, they want to survey people, uh, and they're saying that the direct brain interfaces and so forth are not going to be advanced enough for many years. Um, I kind of question that, and I'm not sure we needed, we don't need to read people's thoughts. What we need to do is read their somatic markers, which are, you know, the emotional levels. Now, I think that that is it's already happening, and I think that will happen soon enough that we can incorporate that information. It's far more realistic than surveying people when you have all sorts of issues. Now, it's not that easy to interpret. i certainly grant you that. I mean, if someone's angry, you have no idea why he's angry. Um, and there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done here. But I guess what I'm saying is that uh, I think this is the direction that we need to head. Because if we ignore people's needs and we ignore their somatic responses, then I think we, we come up with that situation where either the AGI, the superintelligence by itself without the people, um, is going to have its own needs, which will have nothing to do with human beings, or potentially could have nothing to do with human beings, or uh, we don't have a self-aware entity, which I will so it seems to me worth investigating <coughs> um, to look at how we might make sapiens plurum involve these somatic markers and, the, and to consider a different sort of arrangement that includes the fear of complexity or the risk of complexity which brings on total unpredictability and unknown situations, which is really what I think human beings try to avoid by making fewer decisions um, than a chess playing level. So I've come up, I'm really interested in hearing your feedback, and um, I've thought that the kinds of things we need to do is to look at the kinds of decisions that require value judgment and look at different types of decisions, because it's, of course, a lot different from looking at do I pick up a $20 bill and hand it back to someone who's dropped it on the street versus um, do I intervene in a nation slaughtering its minorities? You know, you've got different kinds of ethic and levels of ethical decision making. 
that may require different sorts of approaches. And then um, look at testing. I mean, how do you test anything like this to even decide whether you're on the right track? Uh, that in itself is a, is a huge problem. So it's, it's kind of a, I think it, I hope I've given you a sort of new way to look at things. Uh, and I'm very interested in your feedback on it. Uh, and, and to hear what you have.